like we got everybody on. Okay. Romans chapter six. We're going to just start reading in verse one. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how should we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also uh, be in, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ hath no, uh, knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead, uh, I apologize. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death had no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members are instruments, uh, are your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Well, verse 14 pretty well sums it up, and we're going to talk about dominion. If the title would be, it'd be sin's dominion. Dominion is a word used like lordship. It's uh, it's who you serve. And the idea of this chapter has got so many things that we can put together with Paul's writings. But sin here is not sins. It's a, it's a nature of man. And uh, it follows chapter five. Go with me to chapter five, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam. And uh, we realize that in the Bible, in Genesis, God made a man and his name was Adam. And he was told that he could do everything but one thing. He could not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And of course, we know that he landed up doing that. And the Lord had told him, if you eat of that tree, you'll die because it's a knowledge, okay? Uh, a man has knowledge of right and wrong in him, and it comes from the knowledge of good and evil, and that's the blood that's passed to us. There's nothing you and I can do about it. Now, man has believed for years, uh, especially in uh, uh, most religions, believe that the, the way you get to God is to keep some form of law. The law looks good. The law is good. It's spiritual. The Ten Commandments were good. They were given of God. They were not given uh, from some evil de being, uh, demon or something. It, they're good. They're, they were given of law, but they were given to a certain people named Israel. And the law, it would not save a person. It would teach them. It was a schoolmaster. And in teaching people, Israelites, they would know what they should do to be in a relationship and a fellowship with God. Now, what we got to find out here is, is why is Paul writing these things in Romans? Let's go back <clears throat> to verse 12 again, Romans 5. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. Okay. So our death came from Adam, being born of Adam. It, it did not come because we sinned. It did not come because of our action in the life, in the lifetime. It, it, that's not what causes us to die. Uh, people say, well, it's your sins that make you die. If it was, there would be nobody alive. Sins are not what cause us to die. Sins are what we do 
because we have the nature of sin. The nature of sin came from our birth and we can't do anything about it. And the only way you ever lose that is to die. And we have a merciful heavenly father that knew what he was going to do for us before the foundation of the world. And he was going to let another man die for us. And we'll get into that later on in his Jesus Christ. But I want to read some more about this. In Romans chapter 5, verse 13, following up, let's go back to 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. All have sinned. All have been born. All the things have happened in our life. All right, now watch. For until the law, sin was in the world. Okay. Now, you, you recognize in the scripture that sin, being a schoolmaster, is telling you about what you're doing wrong in sinning, what your sins are. In other words, uh, the Ten Commandments tell you each thing. If you break them, you have sinned, and on and on. And <clears throat> because of your nature, you're going to die, but that's not the only thing that's going to happen. You're also going to be judged. Hold here and go to Hebrews chapter 9. Not only is death involved, but judgment. In Romans cha uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 9, verse 27. As it appointed unto men once to die because of Adam. But after this, the judgment. The judgment would be because of what your sinning life was like. You commit sins, you break the commandments, uh, you break the ordinances, you break your conscience, everything else. You, you're, you're not only going to die because of Adam's transgression, but you're going to be judged for what you did. Now, that puts us in a serious problem because what do we do to clean up our sins? Okay, now let, I'm just trying to make this as simple as I can. What are we going to do to clear up our sins? Well, the people that were under the law, the uh, Israelites, look in Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have uh, great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brother, my kinsman, according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law and the service God promises. So I've got right there in front of me in black and white that Israel was given the law. Go back to Romans chapter two and look at what Paul says about Gentile. And we're Gentiles. All right, Romans chapter two, verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, we didn't ever have the law. It wasn't given to us. We were Gentiles. And not having the law, what are we going to do to clean up our sins? Because we are going to die. It's appointed once for men to die. And after this, the judgment. What if God took care of both problems? That would be incredible. That would be a great news, gospel. Good news. Well, the good news is that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to scripture. Now, you got to think about this. Christ died for our sins. He was not going to die the way he was born. He was born of the virgin. He had no earthly father. His father was God Almighty. He had the blood of God in him, and that blood was not uh, made bad by his disobedience. He had none. Uh, let's go back to Romans 5 and, and connect with this in, in saying it. All right, in Romans chapter 5, verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ. So, okay, so we, we have it here. We got Adam and we got Jesus Christ. 
Adam is told not to do something, and he does, and it causes death. Thus, all his offsprings, all the people who are born of Adam, which we all are, are going to die because of his disobedience. But the last Adam, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes into the world, he comes as a man, but he comes with the heavenly blood, the blood of God. And he lives his life, and he has the opportunity to disobey because he's flesh, but he doesn't. He's tempted in all points like as we are yet, knew no sin. And being without sin, God takes him and makes him to be sin for us. In other words, he becomes death for us. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, being, being as the virgin born son of God and have not tasted sin, has not done any disobedience, he shouldn't die. There's no reason for Jesus to die according to the law. He kept the law righteously. He did the commandments. He did all things that were righteous. He fulfilled all righteousness. So according to the law, if the law can save, he shouldn't die. But the law to be fulfilled because people sin, there is a death because of Adam and a judgment because of sinning. Now watch this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he, God, hath made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. Now, if there comes a point in history, AD 33, when all of a sudden Jesus Christ becomes sin, he will die. Why? The wages of sin is death. Now, we know that Jesus hasn't been committing sins. We also know that he doesn't have the nature of sin from an earthly father. He has the blood of God. So what is God doing? God is taking a man, his son, and making him to be a legitimate sacrifice that would satisfy God. Are you with me? He would satisfy God, all the law of God, the disobedience of man. He would satisfy it. He would become that sacrifice that would satisfy God in everything that had made us separate from him. And he did it, and it was called reconciliation. Because of Adam, we were away from God. We were called children of disobedience, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Not disobedient children, children of disobedience. You see, there's a lot of people think that because of your disobedience, because of your disobedience, you're going to die. No, it's because of Adam's disobedience, you're going to die. Go back to Romans chapter 5 and watch. In Romans chapter 5, verse um, 17, for by one man's offense, Death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life uh, by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came unto all men unto justification of life. For if by one man, Adam, one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now you understand, a righteous person is one that does everything right. Now go back to Romans chapter 3 and watch. In Romans chapter 3 verse 10, as is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Everybody on this program today, none of you and me are righteous. Thus, if we're not righteous, we can't go to God. Because of Adam, go back to um, 
chapter uh, 5, verse 18. Therefore, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That's the judgment. We're going to die, and then we're going to be judged for what we do. Okay? Point once for men to die, and after this, the judgment. He said, even so by the righteousness of one. There was one person on this earth that was righteous. Righteousness is keeping everything the way God wanted it. And that's what Jesus Christ did. He kept the law. He kept the ordinances. He kept everything right. He Everything he did in life was righteous. He did it according to the words that were written about him. And thus, he is walking righteousness. Now, this walking righteousness pleased the Father. And in uh, John, we see uh, him have the Father sealed. He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Lord was well pleased with him. Well, how cruel would it be for a God that saw his Son live perfect, live righteous, how cruel would it be if he lets him die and not serve the purpose it was for? Now, you think I'm kidding. I'm not. <clears throat> People that confess their sins are saying that Jesus didn't pay for them. That's not the message of Paul. Paul said, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We are forgiven because of a righteous person that by faith lived on this earth. And by his faith, he pleased the father because his father looked at him and saw righteousness, total righteousness, nothing wrong, no disobedience, no anything. He saw that. And he said, I can take him now because he has proved what righteousness is, I will take him and make him to be sin for Jerry Sanders. When I make him sins, that's going to cause him to die. Thus, he will fulfill one part of Hebrews 9. It's appointed once for men to die. He is going to die. When he dies, it's because he's going to die to pay for my sins. The judgment. The judgment he's paying is for my sins. The cup of wrath is upon him. Everything that God should pour out on me is poured out on his son. He is the living sacrifice that satisfies God. God is satisfied with what Jesus Christ did. Well, I have a chance to be in him. How can I be in him? Turn to Galatians chapter 2. People say, uh, uh, you got to live it. Live what? Jesus lived it for me. Then he died for me. He went down into the depths of hell for me and paid for anything that I would ever have to pay. And then when he arose, God forgave me. And I'll give you these verses in a minute. But Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Can you say that about yourself? Can you reckon it? Hold, hold this. And we're going to come right back, back and forth. In Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6. All right, Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man, that old man that was a child of disobedience, born of Adam, born of a disobedient father, Adam, earthly father, Adam, disobedient, going to cause us to die because wherefore is by one man, Sin in the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all of sin, all. There's none righteous. I'm an unrighteous individual. I cannot satisfy God with the flesh. Romans 8, 8. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. So I'm walking around in the flesh. And God 
one day preaches to me. If you tuned into this program today, God is preaching to you through his word. Please God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us, which is our saved, it's the power of God. The cross is where a man died that shouldn't have died. The cross is where a man became sin for us who knew no sin. He should not be on that cross. He's innocent. But he became us. And when he became us, he died. When he died, he died for our sins. He's going to take the judgment away. He's going to be in hell three days and suffer hell to keep us from suffering from hell. And in the third day, God is going to forgive us and raise his son. Ephesians chapter 4, very clear on that. We'll go just a second, but I want to read verse Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man, the unrighteous man, the disobedient man in being born, child of disobedience, the old man is crucified with him. Not will be crucified, shall be crucified, is crucified. We have been crucified, and crucifixion is a death. That's how you die, okay? Crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Our body can be destroyed, and yet we'll have eternal life. Why? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The flesh can be destroyed. It doesn't matter how it goes away. A car wreck, cancer, it doesn't matter. If the body goes away, that's been taken care of because we were crucified with Christ. If the body that we live in is taken away, God has a house for us made without hands eternal in heaven. A new body awaits us if we lose this body. This is compliments of being crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. God has done this spiritually so that I could live my life in Christ. I am alive, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I am the walking, living testament that the resurrection of Christ is true. Jesus Christ being raised from the dead, I am in no longer in my sins. Uh, I'm going to read this, Romans 6, uh, 6, knowing this, that old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And if you question people, all people believe that Jesus rose from the dead that are religious or have any church-going attitude. Well, look in 1 Corinthians 15, look in verse uh, uh, 17. And if Christ be not raised, okay, your faith is vain, you're yet in your sins. According to Paul's gospel, remember Jesus Christ of the sea today was raised from the dead according to my gospel the gospel that Paul preached. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to scripture, and was buried and rose again the third day, according to scripture. If we believe, Romans 10, 9, if thou should confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead. If God is raised, has raised his son from the dead and you believe that in your heart, then you must trust what the word of God says. You're not in your sins. You're not in them. Those sins are not going to judge you. You have no confession of sins because they're gone. You're forgiven. Look in Ephesians chapter 4. When Jesus died, he's in the tomb. The body's in the tomb. His soul's in hell. Okay? The body's laying there and it's resting in hope because it knows that the Soul of Jesus will come back into his body the third day, rise and go to the Father. It's promised in the scripture. And the scriptures cannot be broken. So 
Jesus is down in hell. His soul is suffering in hell. For what? He didn't do anything. He died for our sins. He's down there in hell for our sins and what we did. And so Romans, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. He can't raise his son from hell until he forgives you. Now, I, I'm going to stop just a second. When Christ rose from the dead, it's because you were forgiven. You may not have known that. You might have thought that you, to get forgiveness, had to do some form of activity, such as walking the aisle or turning from your sins or saying a sinner's prayer or confessing, uh, repenting, and those kind of things. That is not what the verse says. When Jesus Christ, who is in hell, his soul was in hell, and, and, and people might not believe that. So let's go to Acts 2 and see. In Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, very clearly, this is what the scripture says. In verse uh, 29. Men and brethren, Acts 2, 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you, the patriot David, that he's both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne. He, seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did not see corruption. This Jesus had God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. So Peter says, Jesus was down in hell. His soul was in hell. His Flesh was resting in a tomb. But there came a time when God raised his son. Peter does not show us what the resurrection does for us. He shows that the resurrection proves that Jesus Christ is the son of God. But look with me in the book of Philippians and see what Paul says. In the book of Philippians chapter 3. And Paul was a religious Jew kept the law he thought and didn't because there's none righteous and keeping the law is righteousness and he was circumcised he had all the credit all the credits needed to be a full blooded Jew uh, in the covenants ordinances everything and he said all of that in verse 8 yeah doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I suffer the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ, that I might win Christ. Everything that Paul ever did religiously, he counted but dung. Now, I'm sure that people can't do that. I understand that. It's very hard to give up what you've done. But Paul did. He said, it's dung. Everything I did, everything I did was dung because it's sin. You understand? Everything we do in the flesh is sin. Verse 9, be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which he thought as a Jew, he was touching the righteous law, blameless. That's up in verse uh, 6. Everything he did in his Jewish religion, he believed to be righteous. And all of a sudden, when the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, and then later on, all the visions he got, he realized everything I did in the flesh Everything I did, you understand, everything I did. He's a Jew, a circumcised, Hebrew of the Hebrews, a lawyer, Pharisee, uh, as touching the righteous law of blame. He kept the law, he thought, in his own mind. And I'm sure he'd made sacrifices and did all that. And, and you know, all that, dumb, every bit of it. To get a person that's religious, to believe what Jesus really did. They have to submit to somebody else's righteousness and give up trying to satisfy God. You cannot satisfy God in the flesh. It won't work. You cannot do it. In verse nine, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is the, the law. You see, the only way you could ever have righteousness is the law, but Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. 
but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteous, which is of God by faith. The faith of Jesus Christ. There's a point in history that they have put this man, who they couldn't find anything wrong with, so they lied about it. And Paul says, what's, what's wrong with him? And, well, you know, then they said this. and I said, He said, I found nothing wrong with this. Why do you want to kill this man? He said, you got a choice. You can, uh, you can let him go and, and keep these men on the cross, or Barabbas. No, no, we want Barabbas. Well, why do you want him? What did he do wrong? He's done nothing wrong. Jesus Christ is tempted all points like as we are yet knew no sin. He has done nothing wrong that deserves death. And yet he's put on a cross. And being put on a cross, he's nailed to this wooden tree, this cross, in his hands and his feet. They have beaten him, pulled his beard out, spit in his face. They've done everything that they possibly can do except kill him because they're going to let the cross kill him, the Roman cross. And there comes a point in Jesus' life. I'm talking about a point in his life where he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He become you. He became you right there. And everything about you from your being a child of disobedience, born of Adam, unto all the things you're going to you have done in your life or going to do in your life are put on him and he died. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He gave himself. He died so it be for our sins. And his soul left his body and went down into hell. And in hell, he suffered three days so that we'll never go there. We will never go to hell. Why? Jesus went to hell for us. Well, then, Pastor Jerry, where would we go if, if we don't trust him? You'll go into death. Death and hell are considered in Revelation 20. And when death and hell are raised and judged, they're cast into the lake of fire forever. The lake of fire is the destiny of people that will receive not the love of the truth. For people that try to work and try to earn and try to, uh, they say, obedience, obey God. And they get baptized or they join the church or confess their sins and say the sinner's prayer, turn from their sins. All of those things will not have eternal life. They go into death. Why? Because it's what God says, not what I believe. Why, how could I deny everything that people say and make it right? I don't. I read what God says. The power of God's resurrection. Now watch in verse 10, Philippians 3.10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. What is the power of his resurrection? The power of his resurrections back in Ephesians. The power of his resurrection is... Ephesians 4.32, be kind ten, uh, to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You're forgiven. You're not forgiven because you quit sinning. You're not forgiven because you're a good person. Go back to Romans chapter 3. Jesus was confronted by a man, and he said, good master. He said, why callest thou me good? There's none good but my Father, which is in heaven. In Romans chapter 3, verse 12, they're all gone out of the way. There is not, they are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. If you plan to stand before God and show your goodness to him, you'll have nothing. If you plan to show God your righteousness, you have none. What you need is to understand. And look in Romans 3.11. There is none that understand. There is none that seeketh after God. You never sought God in church. 
God wasn't there. You don't understand. God gives us understanding in the writings of Paul, Romans through Philemon. We as Gentiles need understanding. Look in Romans chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and watch. In Ephesians chapter 4, everything that people do themselves is called vanity. It's vain. It's worshiping in vain. Uh, vanity is I did this, I did that. There was a public and a, and a, 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 a Pharisee and a publican went in to pray in the temple. And, uh, the Pharisee went up front and the, the publican sat in the rear. And I, if it's a Pharisee or a, I'm not sure, I have to look. I don't want to misquote this to you. The publican and the sinner. Uh, the sinner is a publican. Uh, they went up to pray. I don't know why I'm misquoting that. I'm just thinking it. Let's see. I apologize. Two men went up to pray. That's, I guess, uh, I don't want to say, say the wrong word. I apologize to you. Uh, Steve Anyadi, do you know that verse, Matthew? The publican and the sinner, uh, the Pharisee and the publican. Oh, I apologize, folks. I hate to kill dead air. Anyway, two men went up to pray. One was a religious individual and one was a sinner. I knew it, knew he was a sinner. And folks, if you don't think you're a sinner, you're not really thinking too hard because we all are. And if you don't think God knows you're a sinner, you're not thinking real hard because, you know, the sinner's prayer, God, I'm a sinner. I don't have to tell God I'm a sinner. The whole writings is about how men are sinners. So they went up to pray and one went to the Luke rear 18. of the... What is it? Luke 18. Luke 18. I apologize. Luke 18. The, 18 and what, 10. It, what does it say? Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other Republican. Yeah, I did have it right. Pharisee. Okay. A Pharisee is a supposedly a righteous law observing individual. The publican's a sinner. Okay. I got news for us. We're all publicans. We're all sinners. You know, they got mad at Jesus and the, the Pharisees and the scribes and whatever. And they said, why does your master eat with publicans and sinners? Because there's nobody else to eat with. We're all publicans and sinners. We're, we're all sinners. All of sin that comes through the glory of God. And so they go up to pray and this, this publican, he back there, he, he really feels like he ought not even speak. But the Pharisee, he goes up in the front. He stand. I thank you, God. I'm not like other men are, especially that publican back there. I fast and I give my tithes and all that. And see, most people believe that tithing and fasting and all the religious things they've done in their life is how you get to God. That is not how we get to God. The way we get to God is by through the foolishness of preaching. God is not going to let us have the glory no matter what we do. You cannot glory. There is no, he does not share his glory. <clears throat> if God lets you be born in this world and he had let Adam transgress freely and gave you that transgression end results of death, he is going to save you because salvation belongs to the Lord, Psalm 3, 8. And salvation belonging to the Lord, you're going to have to give him the credit of salvation. You cannot say, I got saved. No, you didn't. You didn't get saved. You were saved by God. You could say, I receive it. I trust it. I accept it. But that's all you can do. But you didn't do anything to get saved because salvation belongs unto him. And belonging to him, you understand, we have to hear it. And the Ephesians chapter four, 
uh, verse 17, this I say therefore and testify unto the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles, uh, uh, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now, I'll read a verse, familiar verse with everybody that studies with us, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. A gospel that shows the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of his son, has nothing to do with you and I. We didn't do anything to cause this or to bring it forward to make it happen. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them or lost. If you did not know the gospel when we started this message, you're lost. And if you're lost, nothing you ever did in your religious life ever solved it. You stayed lost. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There has to come a day in your life when you reckon something. Now, we're all Southerners except for the Yanks. And the word I reckon so is common down here. I reckon so. You want to go with us? I reckon so. That's just a common saying, reckon. Reckon is saying, I believe it will. Okay? Or, yes, I will. It's okay. I reckon. Okay? I reckon that's right. Well, there comes a time in your life, and it's going to come by preaching. Because 1 Corinthians 1 says, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You're not going to be able to dig this truth out. You're not going to be able to learn your way to salvation. You're not going to be able to, to claim that you got it. You're going to get it preached to you. When people invite you to hear the preaching, there's a reason. It's God's will for you to be saved. The will of God is for all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. He wants you to be saved. He doesn't want you to come to a point in your life where you're going to give up this body and die, go into death, and then be raised with death, uh, with hell, and be judged and cast in the lake of fire. That's not God's will. God's will is for you to be saved because he made all the provision. He did everything that's necessary in his son for your salvation. Now what? In Romans chapter uh, uh Let's see, Romans chapter 6, verse uh, 23. The wage of sin is death, okay? So to pay for sin because of that, I got to die. And it don't matter if I have cleaned up my life or I've been a virtuous person. A lot of women are virtuous. They have the same husband all their life. That's virtue. That's not righteousness. Never mix up virtue and righteousness. There is none righteous. No, not one. Nobody. None. There's none that understand. According to the Ephesian letter, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. And they try different kinds of ceremonial things to do to get in the will of God and worship. But the will of God is for them to be saved. But how can they be saved if salvation belongeth unto the Lord? Because it belongs to him, and he accomplished it in his son. Now, look in uh, uh, Romans 6. There is a time in your life when you have to reckon God's salvation is true. Now, watch this. In Romans 6, 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. I cannot die. I reckon that's true, God. Why? Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I have eternal life. It was a gift. The gift comes by a gift of righteousness. Look in Romans 5, verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. 
for if through the offense of one man, Adam, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abundant, abounded unto many. There's a gift out there that God will give you. It's already been accomplished. It's already been satisfied, sealed, and secured. That gift, God will give you righteousness by Jesus Christ. He will give you justification of life. Now watch, Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Why would Jerry Sanders be allowed to live eternally considering what I've done in my life? I have never been righteous and I've never pleased God in the flesh. I've never done any good. I have never produced anything that would even come near what Jesus Christ did in his life. Why would God let me have life because it is a gift and a gift must be received it has to be received or it is a it's it's no value to me that'd be like somebody come to your door <clears throat> and bring a box wrapped gift i mean the gift is wrapped up beautifully and they say this is yours we want to give it to you and you look at them and say ah I don't know you, Madam. Why should I take it? And you close the door in their face. So he sets it outside on the porch. And you never open it. And it was something that you needed dearly in your life. But you never opened it. You never wanted it because I didn't earn that. What is. Why is that person, I don't want that gift. And the God of this world, Satan, has made it to where you don't want God's free gift. You want to earn it by showing your re religious acts and how that you've been a virtuous or a righteous person. You wouldn't do people wrong. and You've tried to live your life the best. And, you know, trying to live your life the best means you didn't do it. Trying is not doing. And you never take the gift that is available. I used to yeah, use a story about my dad. This is not true, but it's a story that you can look at. My dad is well off. He's got lots of money. I go out and establish a business and the business is really hard because of the financial responsibilities and the things. I'm struggling quite a bit. And my dad sees me struggling and he's proud of me because I'm trying, but he knows I can't make it. I can't make it at all. I'm struggling. You never made mad, God mad if you tried to keep the law. Don't get me wrong. Trying to keep the law, that they're, they're, the law is spiritual, but you're carnal, so don't understand. And try your best, and you're not going to make it. You're, it's, it's not going to work. You just can't do it. You cannot accomplish it in the flesh, and you can't please God in the flesh. So my, my father, he, he sees me struggling in business, and so he puts a million dollars in my savings account without me knowing it. And he tells his friend, his best friend, he said, I'm dying of cancer. And when I die, I want you at the funeral to give my son this letter, Jerry. Okay. So my dad dies of cancer, which is a true story. He died of cancer. And we go to the funeral and his best friend hands me a letter addressed to me. And being addressed to me, I look at it and I put it in my coat pocket because I got people there I got to talk to and everything. And <clears throat> it's in the inside of my suit pocket. And I go home, I take the suit off, hang it up, and I forget about the letter. And I don't read the letter. 
That's the problem with people. They don't read the Bible. They take what the preachers, the priest, or anybody else says without actually reading the Bible and seeing if it's true and what you're reading, whether it's to you or to Israel. You've got to discern the difference between Israel's doctrine and you. Our doctrine is Romans through Philemon, written by Paul, who is our apostle. And so I'm struggling in my business really bad. And finally, it comes to point, I've got to go to the bank and get some money. I've got to borrow some money so that I can have some financial help in the business. And I go and talk to my banker and I say, I need to borrow some money. And he said, well, why not? My business is failing. I need some help financially to keep it going and keep it on a level. And so he goes and he comes back and he says, why do you need money? And I said, because I'm broke. And he said, no, you're not. Well, yeah, I am. I got no money. He said, you've got a million dollars in the savings. I said, what? And he said, your father put a million dollars in the savings account for you. Huh? And it hits me. He wrote me a letter. So I go home and get in that suit and get that letter out. And I say, it says, son, I love you. I know you're struggling. I know you can't make it. I want to help you out. I want to take care of you. I put a million dollars in the bank. Before I was ever born, God took care of me. He took care of me by the faith of someone else, the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ became sin, he did it willingly. He gave himself to the Father to do this. He gave himself to death. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He gave himself willingly to be that sacrifice that would help a person who cannot save themselves. We all fear death. Death comes on all of us if the Lord tarries. But death is just a means of losing this body for a saved person. But for somebody that's not saved or sure about it, it's losing this body and the soul going down into death. And there's no future for it because death will go into the lake of fire in Revelation 20. So in 1 Corinthians 15, before I was ever born, Verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 9, Paul said, who has saved us, Paul and Timothy, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. Oh, wow. I go to bed at night and I get up in the morning and I don't have to worry about death as a end results. It's not the end. Death is the transport to my heavenly father in Christ. My life is hid there. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, if you then be risen with Christ, if is your decision, do you believe that when Christ rose from the dead, you rose with him? And, and you understand, you don't feel this. And you couldn't prove it to anybody except by the scripture because it's not something that's tangible that you can grab a hold of. It's something that God says. We must believe that God did this. The operation of God, he cut us away from this old man in Christ. He let us be crucified with Christ. Thus, God is seeing us on that cross, crucified us, buried us, and raised us a new creature. We're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good work. We are his work. 
were not our works. We didn't produce anything. He did it. Uh, in Colossians 31, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above. Uh, uh, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. You're dead. Are you listening? For you are dead. Can you believe God saying that to you? You're dead. But Brother Jerry, I'm alive. That's what Galatians 2 said. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. The old man does not live and exist before God any longer. He killed it. Your old man is gone. Can you reckon that? Can you reckon that to be true? Can you trust God for verse 3, Colossians 3, 3, for you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. The glory has been processed. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We've all come short of the glory of God in flesh. But in 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before, uh, before the world unto our glory. Now watch, Romans 8. This is what God said. Can you reckon it to be true? Or are you going to stand on your religion and what you've done in your life religiously, which Paul said is dumb, because it does not say the things that we're saying? Now watch in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Glorified. Now understand, if you get invited to where what I'm saying is being preached, then God is calling you. And are you going to be the called? Many are called, but few are chosen. So, Brother Jerry, how can I be the called? Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. You're sitting in a class today. The gospel, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, now, you understand, just because you study Bible studies or go to, uh, go to church or just because you've been a good person or just because you know the grace message, that doesn't mean you're saved. Saved is a day when you reckon God to be true. You let him be true. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, more, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. More brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to scripture. A day in Jesus' life, after living his entire life righteously, holy and without blame a day in his life god made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of god in him we have to be made righteous we're not righteous we can't attain righteousness we have to be made righteousness it comes through the faith of jesus christ the moment that Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, 
Why hast thou forsaken me? And he gave up the ghost and died. He's you. Him being you, he represents you in death, burial, and resurrection. Turn to Colossians. In the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 10. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You're cut away. The old man is cut away from. You're actually living holy and without blame before him in love. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. Can you reckon this to be true? Can you trust God to have done this for you? Or are you going to say, I don't need that. I don't want that gift. I don't need my father's million dollars that he put in the bank. Yes, I do. You see, the moment you become lost in knowledge is when you need to be found. The moment you become lost and somebody shows you the light of the glorious gospel, then you can receive his forgiveness and quit trying to get your own. I don't need to be forgiven. I am forgiven. Uh, Acts chapter 13, Paul said, by this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Turn to Acts 26. Well, I want to continue this. Verse 12, Colossians 2, 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith, the operation of God who raised him from the dead. God's operation on you was that he cut you away from your body, spiritually minded. And he took you down with Christ and the sins were paid for. Then when Christ came up, God forgave you and his son arose and you raised with him, Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, raised with him and seated you at the right hand of the Father in Christ. Christ represents my holiness, my unblameness, my righteousness, my forgiveness, seated right there at the Father and he mediates for me. He intercedes for me. And in doing so, I reckon it to be true. I trust you, Father. You're my Savior. Your way of saving me is the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior. My Savior represents me. I am holy and without blame, according to Ephesians. Uh, well, Colossians, since you're there, Colossians chapter 1, verse 22, in the body of his flesh, flesh through death, to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. It's hard to feel holy and without blame in the life we live. You have to feel it. No, you can't. That's what people are trying to do. They're trying to feel saved. They're trying to feel like they've satisfied God. You can't. You can't do it. It is God that did it. We have to trust it. Then God seals us because, hey, you live in life, you get crazy sometimes. Sometimes you forget. God don't forget. He seals and the reason he seals you is there's actually a moment in your life when you actually trust what God said without any reservation. You reckon it to be true. You see, a lot of people try to fake salvation. They try to do things and, and you know, make, <clears throat> make people think they're saved or whatever else. You can't fake God out. There has to come a point in your life when Boom. I can't do it, God. I believe you. I'm saved. You made me holy and without blame before you in love. The faith of your son was enough. He died for my sins, of course, scripture and was buried and rose again the third day. And I couldn't go to hell if I even wanted to, which I don't, because you forgave me. Amen.
Amen.